Hello, my name is Carla Pascoe-Lay. I'm a historian at the University of Melbourne. Today I'm going to be giving a paper titled The Last Generation, Environmental Activism and the History and Future of the Family. Now I'm just going to bring up my slides to share with you. So today I'm speaking to you from Wathaurong Country on the southern coastline of Australia, where bellerine yellow gums, mangroves and moona trees guard the land and where the mighty Barwon River rushes out to meet the ocean. I'd like to start with a quote from Jane Fonda, American actor and environmental activist. When interviewed about her activism in 2019, she stated, we are the last generation who can make the difference between life and death of the planet. This is an urgent crisis and we have very little time to fix it. Fonda here is referencing the concept of generation in the sense of a broad socio-historical cohort. We're all of us broadly part of this generation to whom she refers, a group of people alive at the beginning of the third millennia, confronting the cons consequences of climate change, mass extinction, and other forms of environmental destruction. But generation can, of course, also refer to a group of people within a family who were born at the same stage of a family tree. I'm deliberately playing with Fonda's intended meaning here to suggest that our socio-historical generation confronts the philosophical possibility that we are the last generation in our families. Not literally, of course, but metaphorically, in the sense that to confront climate change head on is to confront the loss of imagined futures for the human race. And this was the point of this Extinction Rebellion protest pictured here, entitled Empty Prams, Empty Futures. When we speak of generations, we invoke the past and the future. We invoke lineages and relationships between people and time periods. When a person decides to become a parent, by implication they assert a belief that there will be a future for the human species in which their child may participate. But we are now living through the age of the Anthropocene, an epoch in which human actions are threatening the future of the natural world in direct and measurable ways. Across the globe, environmental activists have been protesting the wholesale destruction of the planet in ever greater numbers. Young people who will live through the worsening effects of climate change are prominent in their ranks. But so too are those in direct familial relationships with young people, their parents and their grandparents. Since late 2019, I have been conducting interviews with environmental activists in partnership with the National Library of Australia. In my paper today, I will analyse the life history interviews of three narrators, considering the ways in which both intergenerational relationships as well as relationships to different temporalities, inform the motivations of parents and of grandparents involved in environmental activism. The first activist I'm going to introduce you today is Catherine, a grandmother in her mid-70s. Born in 1943 in London, her mother's struggles with mental illness dominated Catherine's childhood. Her mother was placed in a mental institution and given electric shock therapy when Catherine was young. Catherine's mother was later discharged to raise her daughter, essentially as a single parent as her father lived in India. Catherine recalled feeling angry that her mother couldn't be like everyone else's mother, but she also appreciates the fact that her mother fought fiercely to gain financial aid to give Catherine a good education. Catherine remembers her as a strong woman who didn't give up easily. Those are the things to remember her by, not her mental illness. Catherine particularly valued the way her mother imparted an appreciation of the natural world. We knew every wildflower, knew every bird, the walks we used to do, and knowing every, you know, little path and every little byway. And yes, everything to do with nature is always something I've grown up with. Catherine met Peter while travelling in Australia and they decided to, have to marry and have children. Catherine worked as a teacher and supported her husband's role as an Anglican priest, firstly in Melbourne and eventually in outback New South Wales. It was here that Catherine became more intimate with the flora and fauna of her adopted country, 
through learning about Indigenous connections to their country. She wishes that she had possessed this knowledge earlier to teach her own children as they were growing up. She's trying to make up for this with her grandchildren. She said, I think probably I realise now and I make a point of talking to the grandchildren about the need to know about Aboriginal history, to know about politics and what they do or don't do. We've taken them up to Japwaram, the sacred Indigenous birthing trees at Ararat, so that they can begin to see and to understand. From 2008, Catherine began to get more involved with political issues, participating in door knocking, phone calling and handing out pamphlets with environmental organisations. But it was Greta Thunberg's school strike for climate in 2018 that really inspired her. I, I think it was just a sudden realisation that I had to do something locally. Um, and, and Greta, really, that was what propelled me because there she was sitting on the street by herself. And I thought, well, I could do that. Where do I do it? That's the issue. Um, I think Peter was quite glad because he said, I'm sick of you shouting at the television. <laughs> Get on and do something. remembers looking at Thunberg and thinking she's only 15 and I'm 75 and I've had so much more of a life than she may and if a young girl can do this so can I. Catherine started a weekly protest outside the office of her federal member for parliament with some sandwich boards that talked about the climate emergency. She was eventually trespassed, sorry eventually arrested for trespassing in a public place but her activism continues unabated. I, I think it was in Catherine's view, good mothers teach their children and grandchildren about nature and mothers are naturally aligned with caring for the planet. I mean, not, and do you know the amount of women who are activists, you know, calling it Mother, mother Earth, that's not for nothing, is it? There's, I'm not saying they're not wonderful men who are concerned for the, for the, for the planet, but yeah, mother says it all, doesn't it? Well, what do you think is the connection between being a mother or a grandmother and uh, caring about the planet? Oh, I think they're all wrapped up in one. Yes, absolutely. And my passion for my grandchildren to have a... to have a beautiful life in this beautiful place. And my anger or my outrage that anyone should spoil that for my children and my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Catherine's narrative is certainly about overcoming failures of the past, including her pleasure that she can express her love for her children and grandchildren in ways that her own mother could not. But her life history is also about building upon the legacy that her mother bequeathed her. Her maternal and grandmaternal love is protective and assertive in ways that are similar to her own mother's. In Catherine's life history, the nurturing side of maternal love also has its fierce aspect, the ferocious rage of mothers when their descendants are threatened. As a father involved in environmental activism, Leonard's life history has similarities to Catherine's but also distinct differences. Leonard was born in 1978 and grew up in the Adelaide Hills. He remembers feeling engaged in politics as a child as his parents would hand out leaflets for their local Labor Party branch, watch the evening news together and discuss political issues with their children. As a child in the 80s, Leonard was aware of certain environmental issues like acid rain or ozone depletion, but protests like the Franklin Dam dispute seemed to prove they were ultimately irresolvable. As an adult, Leonard became a scientist. He married and had two children, the first born in 2012. And he recalls, I don't remember having discussions about the environmental impacts of having a child. We knew that the world has a lot of human beings in it, but I guess we both felt that that was up to us. It was not something we discussed much at that point, but certainly something we now talk about a lot. 
Leonard felt that becoming a parent did not initially change his political attitudes. If anything, he felt fortunate to live in a well-functioning social democracy with free, high-quality health and education systems. But then his perspective on the urgency of climate change started to shift. Leonard anticipated that the Australian federal election of May 2019 would be a climate change election. He believed that Labor would win office and introduce environmental reforms. When a conservative pro-coal Liberal government was instead elected, Leonard decided, I'm going to have to join Extinction Rebellion. He and his wife began attending climate action rallies separately because someone still had to be home to mind their children. He eventually made the decision to place himself in a position where he knew he would be arrested because he felt this is an important part of Extinction Rebellion's strategy of drawing attention to climate change. Leonard explained to me that while he envisages several possible futures for the planet, the possibility that his children may have to live through the worst case scenario of a hothouse planet is what drives his activism. My current thinking is that I will be old before the worst of this happens. But my children won't be. And the prospect of seeing them suffer in such a world even as I'm preparing to leave it, is to me horrible beyond belief. And that makes me um, very worried and, and very sad um, and anxious and strangely not actually depressed. <laughs> um, and the, I think the only reason it doesn't make me depressed is because I feel that I am starting to take action to do something about it. life history interview with a message to, children, to his children, imagining them listening to his interview when they are adults. My current... I would say that I'm sorry I didn't start earlier. Because there was clearly so much to be done. And that I hope I hope we were successful. I think one of the clearest thoughts that I've had on this, which is not by any means an original thought, but people have said the same thing is how would you answer the question asked by your child when they're an adult? Dad, what did you do about the climate emergency? And I think once you've asked yourself that question, it's hard not to do so. Leonard's climate activism is very explicitly and consciously connected to his position as a father. As a scientist, he understands the science around climate change and the possible future scenarios facing the planet. When these future imaginings seemed a long way off, it was possible for him to know them intellectually but detach himself emotionally. Now that he is a father and the science has become starker and the failures of traditional politics more apparent, Leonard can no longer abstract himself from climate change. His relationship to the future is made tangible by his relationship to his children and his perceived oblig obligation to act is directly related to imagining their futures. The third story I want to share with you today is Sarah's. She is a mother of roughly the same age as Leonard. But while Catherine and Leonard have only recently come to environmental activism, she has spent most of her adult life engaged in environmental work and protest. Sarah was born in 1974 and spent her early years in suburban Melbourne then Singapore, and then the regional town of Albury. At university, she became involved in student politics and environmental organisations. Although her parents vote conservatively, Sarah realised that she was in many ways displaying a sense of social justice inherited from her mother. She described it as, my mum's sort of sense of fairness and justice and looking after those who need help. I guess that kind of value that I grew up with would have been coming out there. 
Zara began working for environmental organisations in Melbourne, principally focusing on sustainable living. Zara married a fellow environmental consultant and they had a child together in 2012. She said, I had the overwhelming desire to have a child, which sadly now I often wonder if I'd gone down the other path, she wouldn't have had to put up with this whole climate change scenario. Zara reflected that a decade ago, not many people were considering foregoing having children because of climate change. But in a relatively short space of time, the imagined future of the planet has shifted radically. This is impacting the decisions that potential parents are making in the present about whether to have children. As the student climate strikes began to flare up around the world in 2018, Sarah was struck by the impression that they made. With other parents scattered across Australia, she helped, <coughs> helped found Australian Parents for Climate Action. Sarah worries about the future and actively plans for how she can protect her family from food scarcity and water shortages by becoming more self-sufficient. She also told me, Be real, do you know what I mean? So, but again, thankfully, I have a good meditation practice that helps me kind of um, be, yeah, you know, I was wondering, am I just, is it just a skill that I can be very present and find joy in the everyday and, and not dwell in the worries of the future? Or am I just in denial? I'm not sure. Because <laughs> imagining that stuff, it's like, surely not. Like, I, it's almost impossible to accept that that could really be real. Do you know what I mean? So maybe I'm, I don't think I have fully accepted that that's um, how it could be or that the, there's a very high chance it will be like that. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe my mind's still like there's there's a chance it won't be like that or that we'll be able to find solutions or but it's we're running out of time for those solutions so at some point we have to accept it. Whilst remaining well educated about the likely consequences of climate change, Sarah actively practices optimism and allows for the possibility of doubt. She finds that she needs to suspend some of her concern about the future in order to find motivation to take action in the present. But again. These life histories of three environmental activists display synergies and contrasts. All three are slanted towards different temporalities. Catherine's life history is oriented towards the past. Her activism is powerfully inspired by a connection to nature fostered by her mother and a determination to fight for her offspring, which imitates the protective love that so characterised her own mother. Leonard's life history is firmly focused upon the future. As a scientist, he is equipped with the knowledge and training to fully comprehend the possible ecological scenarios that face the planet. While he finds these possibilities daunting, it is his capacity to imagine the future that most inspires his environmental activism. Sarah deliberately cultivates a proximity to the present. She knows that dwelling too deeply upon the future leaves her anxious. And thus, she consciously inhabits the contemporary moment as a coping strategy. All three narratives display common themes. Parents are seen to be consistently influential across these life histories. Whether or not their precise voting preferences or party affiliations are adopted, parents profoundly impact upon their parents, upon their children's values, in ways that often find political expression, such as Catherine's determination to fight for her grandchildren or Sarah's innate sense of social justice. In all these three narratives, it's clear that a desire for a safe future for their children and grandchildren most inspires these environmental activists. In conclusion, the connections between the history of the family and environmental history are not necessarily immediately apparent. But families are always impacted by the built and natural environments they inhabit. And larger histories of weather patterns, natural disasters and ecosystem shifts influence patterns of familial change and continuity. This paper argues for the importance of considering environmental histories the ways in which nature interacts with culture and patterns of human interaction with ecology alongside histories of the family, childhood and parenthood. 
In the 21st century, environmental forces are asserting themselves powerfully into the private realm of familial and domestic life. In this context, the relational and intergenerational lenses employed by historians of the family have much to offer environmental history. And an intention to environmental context is increasingly important, some would argue imperative, for histories of childhood, parenthood and family composed from the vantage point of the third millennium. Thank you. If you'd like to get in touch, my email address is carla.pascolay at unimail.edu.au.